This underdog's work has kept him top dog for a long time. We've got a brand new ITL, Santa's gift bag. It's a party. You know where you're at. It's Pensado's place. Yeah. Santa's gift bag? I needed you to have something to say. Did I, miss the, did I miss the staff meeting when we rehearsed the show today? You've never attended one anyway, <laughs> so why be inconsistent? <laughs> we have one that's after the show, actually, but Man. we'll tell you about that later. Man, I'm, I am so in the Christmas spirit. I can't tell you. Joy has got just Christmas everywhere. Where do you, where do you come by the house? Ooh, it's ooh. like the dogs have their little Christmas bell collars on. And Are you getting in the Christmas spirit yet? I am. I am. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Would you would you consider like for our fiftieth show before Christmas wearing like a white beard and No, because you have that covered. So we're good. Yeah, but I mean I don't I don't have that North Pole accent like you've got. That's true. Yeah, I'm, you I'm Canadians. full Canadian. You guys uh, Canada, yay. Man, uh, we had a good week, didn't we, Drew? We got a lot done this week. We had a lot of fun. Man, I got this new plug in by Kush, K U S H. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not ready to recommend it yet, but I am that close. It is really good. Oh, cool. it, yeah, it's really good. <coughs> You're but, using uh, it? Yeah, using it yeah, I'm using it. Oh, cool. um, uh, Dave Bryce, my buddy, gave it, gave it to me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, man, I can't wait to uh, get into the show today. I got a good ITL for you guys. Um, <coughs> uh, I think you're going to find this one interesting. And uh, you've got some stuff to take care of, right? Always do. Um, as you know, we want to thank our Vintage King buddies who are always there. And I think we have Drew Townsend in the chat room. Drew, there's his page up, and you know Drew by now. Um, uh, our, uh, we, sometimes we call him Vintage King, sometimes we call him Santa, because we have right here the giveaway, which will be for December 15th. There's your 1073. Right there, there's Vanna White, and you can enter right below at your promo jam code. Great knobs. So make sure you're getting that information in. And Dave's fixation with knobs continues. And switches. <coughs> I like That's switches new. too. That's a new fetish. It used to be just knobs all year. Well, you know. You've graduated? You no, get bored I, with knobs after a while. Like, I still like knobs. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Any, any, any engineer, like this is a great knob, this is not a great knob. Okay. It's size. I see. I see, but this is a great piece of gear. It's a great piece of gear. I'm, I'm coveting it madly. So December 15th, we're going to give that away. Make sure you enter, and we will get that to you. Um, as usual, you know our homework page, where to get to us at Facebook and Twitter. There it is up on the screen, our YouTube channel. Um, obviously, we get to all your comments and stuff. We love hearing from you. Um, our chat room is busy, and you know who mans our chat room. He's the DJ. No, he's not the DJ. He's the Wait, CJ. Our hold on, hold on, Drew. What the deal? What uh, hold on. Take, take your hat off, Drew. Oh. Drew gave himself a mohawk today. Wow. Newly shorn. How'd you do the back, Drew? Very carefully. Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> so get your questions in there, and we'll get to some of those. Um, it's a good one. Why don't we get to our ITL and uh, get to our guests? We need to, because I think Harvey's ready to leave. I don't think he's going to hang around much longer. <laughs> he's just observing this train wreck. <laughs> Let's run it. Let's run it, Will. Hey, guys. Welcome to another ITL. Um, a lot of things on my mind today, so uh, we're going to get right to it. I've got a pretty interesting ITL for you, and as always, what I'm sh the, the, the example I'm showing you is just but one way to use this technique. I'm going to show you how to create your own vocal doubles. And you're going to go, well, Dave, gosh, I got 800 million doublers. Why do I need to create a double? Ah, uh, I'm going to tell you why. Now, what does a double do? Like, like if, you, if you stack a, 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 you've got your lead vocal and you, do a, you record a double, what happens? What makes it a double? Well, a lot of things, but... To my way of thinking, there's three that stick out. The, the original is moving in time, and then the double sometimes gets ahead of the original, sometimes it gets behind the original. Now, when we just add a delay to the dub, to, 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 if we're trying to create a double and we, and we duplicate the original track, we don't record anything. We just duplicate the original track. We delay it a few milliseconds. That, that creates kind of a double, but it's not ever getting ahead of the original. It's always behind. And now a second thing that tends to make a double a double is the change in pitch. So if, you, if a singer sings 
um, a part, and then he doubles that part, re-records it. So he's sharp, sharper than some notes, flatter than others. Now, when we just take the, our original one track, duplicate it, trying to create a double from one track, we have to duplicate the change in time. It can get ahead and behind. The pitch can get above and below. And then there's another factor that's a little more subtle. Well, there's a lot of factors, but the third factor we're going to explore today is timbre, T-I-M-B-E-R, B-R-E, excuse me. Um, and that's, that's, that's the quality of a sound. Uh, so sometimes uh, an instrument or a singer will, will the, the, the quality of the sound will change. So we're going to duplicate that. Let's get started. Here's this bottom one is my original track. Um, this is by a friend of mine in England, Yorg. This is a record I mixed for him. Great, great, great vocal. Sometimes, but how many times to make you realize the love that we had? Sometimes, but how many? Okay. Now what I've done is is a copy of the original. Don't right now. Don't pay attention to these little squiggly lines. Now, if you look really closely, you'll see that this copy is 10 milliseconds ahead of the, of the original. So you say, well, Dave, you said it has to move. Okay, well, it does have to move. So let's try this. Let's take a delay unit. Let's, uh, let's automate the amount of delay. And let's show that automation on the line here. This is my automation line. You notice how the delay is changing as I do as I click on the automation. Now what I've done is in Pro Tools there's a little um, I, I come down here and I select random. Now what random does if I draw if I if I draw on the delay time automation line, I'm exaggerated. This this is what it does. So I get some above, some below. If I do it just right, I get some above and some below. So I'm I'm I, I, I'm I'm I'm. You can you can do this by hand, but it takes longer. I'm cheating because that's a function in Pro Tools. So now, what we've got is. This track is our original track. We made a copy here. We moved this copy to the left, 10 milliseconds, and now we're delaying it so it comes back into time, but in random increments. So with just that, this is what we get. But how many times to make you realize the love that we had? Okay, now, pitch. Let's try, let's, let's figure out pitch. Now, pitch, we can do it with just one track. But I'm gonna put, I'm gonna change the pitch on two tracks. Here's my pitch automation. Um, same thing. You see the pitch moving, various amounts, and now we're gonna also put it on on the uh, on the second track. Just it, it makes it a little, little a little more like like a real recorded double. See how that's moving around. Okay, so now we've got. Let's let's take the let's take the delay off, and let's just listen to what the pitch is doing. Times, but how many times to make you realize the love that we had is signs. Okay, let's take them both off. Times, but how many times to make you realize the love that. Okay, with both of them on, and with the with our delay on. So everything's moving now. Well, almost everything. I got a surprise for you in a minute. Watch this number, this number, and this number. Signs, but how many times to make you realize the love that we had is signs, but how many times to make you realize 
the love that we had is science. Pretty cool, pretty cool. But there's still one little component missing, and that's the timbre. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a channel strip. And what I've done is I've, um, I've automated some, some EQ. So on one track, I've got on one track, I've got this 10, this, this 14K right here. This one the growing with the green. This, this is being automated, and this is being automated. So now let's watch. Times, but how many times to make you realize? Okay, let's put these in. This is, this is going to be subtle. Times, but how many times to make you realize the love that we had is signs. But how many times to make you realize the love that we had. That's kind of a little neat glitch right there. I'd, I'd keep that. That's pretty cool. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm not really paying very wide. So let's, let's, we can really see the effect if we pan wide. Uh, this might be something you might do for a very subtle acoustic guitar part or something you might do for just enhancing uh, some backgrounds. Times, but how many times to make you realize the love that we had is signs. Okay, remember now, you can, you can put it in mono and, and, and it'll give you like a double. It's great for rap, it's great for, for, for um, just like say maybe the, the artist recorded one vocal part for the whole song and you want the chorus to kind of have a little bit of lift to it and you don't have a big background stack. Duplicate it and then just do these doubling techniques just for the chorus. Um, and, and you, 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 you're 100% right. You can just put a fixed pitch and a fixed delay on the, uh, on the duplicated track. But this sounds more real, sounds more natural, and it's fun to do. Come on, let's face it. Some of this stuff we do, not because it's great, it's just fun to do. Um, anyway, hope you enjoy that one. And, and remember, this is just um, a technique. It, it's up to you to figure out better ways to do it. And as always, when you figure out something great, send it to me. I've had about four or five instances last year where you guys sent me something. It was just incredible. Uh, we'll do an ITL just one day for you guys, what you're sending. But anyway, back to you, Dave. I uh, hope, hope you guys uh, enjoyed that. Um, the, key to, the key to that is to, um, is to slide your track forward your, your, your copy of your original track so that you can delay it back and forwards otherwise if you just delay it then you never get ahead i think i made that somewhat clear didn't i heard you did i'm good i'm glad you said that man um 40 something episodes ago I, I one of the first people i thought about having on the show was harvey mason jr i've been a, a big fan of harvey's work for a long time I, I i hate to say how long we've been friends and known each other um <laughs> But it's it's been a minute, and uh, I, I've I've just enthusiastically enthusiastically say it. The genre. <laughs> I've been really it's excited to have him on the did. show. <laughs> uh, I'm saying the genre pretty good now. You're getting better. It's I still can't say not night. Anyway, uh, so I'd like like you guys to meet Harvey. Harvey. Welcome. Thank welcome, you. welcome. Thank welcome. you, guys. Nice to see you, man. Thanks for having Absolutely. me. I love it. Pleasure. Great spot. Uh, one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to have Harvey on is because Herb is jonesing for basketball so badly that. Uh, We're about to get it. I know. A couple more weeks. But uh, Harvey, uh, apart from being a, 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 a truly gifted and, and unique songwriter and producer, actually played in the Final Four for University of Arizona uh, in 1988. Shh. That's not Ooh. supposed to reveal the date. Right. Dude. Yeah, but you were you were a child prodigy. Remember? I was. I, yeah, I went like very 13. early. You were eleven. I think at that. It was yeah. incredible. And um, uh, that's pretty. That's a pretty big deal. Her. <laughs> that was Absolutely. fun. I mean, I don't know what's more impressive. Working on uh, who? Who else was on the team? Oh, Sean Elliott and Steve Kerr oh, and yeah. Tom Tolver, Judd Bushler, uh, Brian Williams. We probably had about ten pros on yeah, that team. Yeah, for sure. Sean Rooks. 
Uh, wow. Have Kenny Lofton. We have some serious talent. Good group of guys. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm the only uh, reject from the bunch. Oh, uh, you've done okay. <laughs> no NBA, though. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all right. That's all right. You took on something harder in some yeah, ways. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know. Is that more impressive than in, uh, Invincible Michael Jackson? He worked on that. No Air, Jordan Sparks, that's which is my has, favorite song. Yeah, nothing to be ashamed of. Um, <laughs> Uh, he produced a movie, mm -hmm. more than a game. LeBron. Mm -hmm. That's basketball. I mm -hmm. heard That's right. that. Well, true. And uh, I think, I think, if memory serves, you. you I know you won an NAACP award, but you also won first or second in Toronto. Yeah. Your mm -hmm. home, your home country. Mm -hmm. A really, really well done movie. Incredible. Did you see it? Did you see it? I did not see it, but I've heard a lot about it. I'm going to send it to you. You yeah. love it. I hear it's great incredible. story. Great guys. Yeah, great yeah. basketball. Good story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And good music. Yeah, that's what I hear. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to limit his credits to about 50. Um, oh, Omarion, I love that song. Um, uh, Still on My Brain, Justin Timberlake. I think I was on that record. Didn't Brian do, do one on that record? Uh, he may yes, have. he did. It was a duet, I think. Yeah. 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 We got nominated for a Grammy, right? Yeah, and that was Justin's first solo record, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, Whitney, Michael, Luther, he did the soundtrack for Dream Girls. He's been doing a lot more stuff. And, He's and got really a, embedded in that more than just the soundtrack. There was, that was, a, yeah, that was, was a deep was, level of involvement for you guys. It? it was all the music, and since it was a, a film about music and performances, there was probably 40 performance, 30 performance songs yeah. in addition to some of the source music and stuff. So that was a major project. It I remember reading about months. you guys' involvement and how deep it went. It was serious. It was a lot of fun, though. And the quality level of it was extraordinary. It was really great work. Thanks. Yeah. Well, it was time period, too. So you're working from music in the 60s and 70s, and you got to make it sound like the 80s. And yeah. So it was, it was definitely a, a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Fun. Absolutely. Can I stop this credit? It's a this short credits, show. Yeah, everyone has a, has a Brittany, website. And Brittany. Oh, my gosh. Chris Brown. And um, we got to give a shout out to your dad. Your dad is uh, Harvey Mason, the senior. original, and, uh, um, the first of the yeah, series, on the remake. One of, <laughs> one, of, one, of one of a handful of national treasures in the jazz realm. I mean, this cat Herb is like you. Well, you know him. He, he's just. There's a video on YouTube. I guess it's still there. I saw it about a year ago. It says Harvey Mason senior. No, I can't remember if it says senior, but anyway, it says Harvey Mason drum solo. Check that out and listen. This guy's his fist feel and pocket will uh, it'll humble you. The cat is, is so good. Did, did did you start out playing drums? I did. I started and I was taking lessons and my dad had a drum set in my room and I was into it. But then I kept going on tour with my dad and seeing him playing. I said I'm never going to be that good. I'm just I got to try something else. So I got me into keyboards and other instruments. And but you had a Quincy Jones moment too, like everybody, didn't you? Uh, as far as being around him, yeah, and, and, yeah, I had a and, lot of Quincy and, Jones and, moments, and, and and having that influence, what you wanted to do, and big time. I wasn't at your level in basketball, but at some point I had to choose between basketball and music, and it was a no-brainer. I chose music. I, 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 I don't. I wasn't good enough to play pro or anything. Well, it's funny because I had that moment, but it was forced upon me because I tore my ACL my senior year in college. So mm -hmm. I was playing. I was starting for the University of Arizona, and uh, we were, you know, one of the top two or three ranked teams. So my hope was to go to the pros, either here or overseas or mm -hmm. something. When I tore my ACL, I sat around for a little while and said, what the heck am I going to do? And that really made the decision for me because I had a passion for music. I loved making music. I always wrote music in my dorms, at my little keyboards and stuff. So You were eight years old when you wrote yeah. a Rover Washington song. I was. That was my first record, first mm. placement. Yeah, That's it's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. I think I was still in diapers at eight years old. <laughs> let's leave that well, story. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> actually, talk about actually we might have come full circle. Have you worked on that Depends endorsement for me yet? You, we're announcing it next week. Okay, good. That and the Sharpie. I want a Sharpie endorsement. I'll settle for the Depends endorsement. I know I can get way more done if I don't have to leave the console. Back when, <laughs> when you and I were hanging out at Enterprise, that's when you first started working with Rodney, wasn't it? You were in it Studio was. E with Rodney. Yeah. Brad was, was working with him, and I was, of course, in Studio C. Yeah. That was, that was Brandy, truthfully, right? Yeah, Brandy was when I started with not Rodney. Your, not never that you're say lying. never. Not that you're lying. That's the name of the no, album. Truthfully, that was. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I think, in 98. Wow. Something like that, 97, 98. And I had a song, Truthfully, and Rodney mm -hmm. was kind of executive producing that record, and he heard it, and he's like, Hey, come on, come work with me, and we'll work together on it. So I, I actually worked with him for two years. You were actually 
engineering programming. You were doing a lot of, you yeah. were doing everything. I yeah, mean, I was doing Pro Tools because that was kind of the early beginning stages of Pro Tools as far as in the record making world. Mm -hmm. And Rodney was using still you know, two inch and 3348 digital machines. Mm -hmm. And when I came with uh, to the studio to do Truthfully with him, I brought my rig and my racks and I my Pro Tools. And I he's remember. like, what is going on? What are you going to do with mm -hmm. this? I said, trust me, let's cut, cut the vocals in this. And then we'll chop him up and fly him. He's like, no, I can fly him faster on my MPC, which is probably true. He was pretty fast on the MPC. But so we flew the vocals in Pro Tools, and he was like, that thing's incredible. You got to come with me and keep working. So I was doing tracks, I was producing, but I was also running the Pro Tools. And from the Brandy record, we went directly to New Jersey to start with Whitney Houston, mm -hmm. um, and then kind of just we Get stuck together on. for the next two years. Yeah, because yeah. we were we got we worked with you in that early, two year period. Yeah, with yeah, Brian yeah. and. Yep. Because um, I remember your rack, and, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your racks and rigs were like legendary. You kind of went to Harvey because you had this thing. Had serious racks. Yeah, man. I love my racks. We'd walk in your room and be like, oh, <laughs> the lights were on. Oh the man, room. it was a big deal. No, I yeah. loved it. Absolutely. I loved it. He, he wrote a song about it. Yeah, no it gear. No, no, that was not my song. Oh, no air. <laughs> I'm all gear. I love gear. No, it's, it's lamenting that you had no gear. You can't work with no air. Yeah, how am I supposed to breathe with no gear? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, through, through the, uh, that was about the same time you met Damon Thomas, right? I met Damon in 2000, or 99, yeah. He was kind of hanging around Rodney as well a little bit, and I was just finishing up. And so when I finished with Rodney and Damon had just finished with Babyface, we met and a couple phone calls later and said, let's get together and write a song. So our first song was a song called I Like Them Girls, mm. which is a Tyrese record. Oh, great record. And Clyde, a lot of people yeah. wanted that record. How did Tyrese end up with that? Three everybody people wanted, wanted that, that record. record, yeah. And three different presidents sat with us and said, hey, we want to give you a deal and blah, blah, blah. And that's how the underdogs were formed because Clive ultimately cut us a check and we didn't have a bank account. We didn't know what to do with it. We're like, well, he said, who do we make the check out to? I'm like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> the underdogs. So that's how it started. I'll be done. Uh, yeah. That's cool. I'll be done. And we weren't trying to start a partnership. We were just writing a song together. And that first one kind of led us into an immediate partnership because we really didn't even know how to do an invoice for it. It was like, we got to come up with something that we can do right. for this. So that's People how it don't understand how often serendipity just takes a pull. You're just, totally. You're just sort of forced into the, this. Yeah. this it's, a, it's, an old, it's that old cliche, the harder I work, the luckier I get. You know? Some things just happen and you just go with it. I was trying to remember the first thing I did with Damon. I think it was Adina Howard. Mm. That was... Back in the day, that was before my we'll, time. We'll save that for Damon's show. Yeah. <laughs> um, man, I got some. I got some questions for you. One of the things I notice when I listen to your records is the the the, the time and the attention and the the um, brilliance of your bridges. I don't. I know that's kind of silly to make a big deal out of somebody's bridges in their songs. No, but, it's not silly. But your I, bridges we, are your bridges. I always tell people that ask me questions about why I'm doing this and this with the bridge, because you understand the importance of what that little eight bar, 16 bar section can do. Is that, is that, is, can you expand on that a little bit? I'd love to, and I just heard a stat last week that only 39% of songs on Pop Radio have bridges now. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. That's weird, right? Wow. That's it's because weird. people don't know how to, don't well, you know gotta go changes. somewhere different, yeah. yeah. The thought behind our bridges is we try and make records that we're proud of and that we love, but a lot of times you have to make records that will work at radio, and it doesn't a lot of times involve a whole bunch of fancy chord changes. You can't get too crazy. So mm -hmm. for us, the bridge is like the moment where we can have our outlet. Mm -hmm. But you've a, always had chord changes. Great always. Chord changes. We've always tried to, but you can't. You have to be careful not to go too crazy. So mm -hmm. the bridge is for us. We can have a lot of fun. And that's kind of the selfish reason our bridges sound the way they do. But as far as kind mm -hmm. of the overall creative picture, we like to go somewhere different on the bridges. We like to take the singer somewhere where they can showcase what they do. We like to take the audience on a, on a, a little break from the kind of mm -hmm. the repetitive hooks or maybe the s simpler melodies in the verses. So you go away with the bridge, you do something special, the singer shines and then hit the outro and, and mm -hmm. kill him in the fade. So mm -hmm. that's the thought behind the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and kudos to you for that. I, 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 lo I love your bridges. Uh, tell me, tell me if, 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 I'm, if I'm right or wrong about this, but as a mixer, you know, I see 300 songs a year, and I notice that, that some songs, the energy of the bridge comes down a little bit, and then you dump them into the last hook and just beat them over the head coming out of the bridge. And then some bridges, it seems like a lot of your bridges, the energy for the song actually comes up, and then you kind of gently lower them down 
with, with manip manipulating the vamp and, and, and the, the last 16 bars of the song. Uh, is, is that something you do consciously? Do you, do, you, do you try to get the energy level to come up in your bridges or to drop it down and then usually, beat them over the head? For me, usually the bridges is a step up from the second chorus. And we try and, as I said, we give the singer a place to go vocally, give them a little bit more range, give them some more ad libs, take them higher in their register. Uh, and then the, you're very astute with your observation. The ends of the bridges, I do two different things. Sometimes we'll take it back down and settle, mm -hmm. and sometimes we'll have a little breakdown after the bridge, which mm -hmm. kind of sets us up for the big mm -hmm. kill mm -hmm. with the last chorus. I love that. Yeah, I, and I, other I times we'll soar out of the end of the bridges, mm -hmm. big high note, kind of, you know, Clive would call it the money note. Well, I need the money note. You know, mm -hmm. that would be where we kill the bridges with the, the, the highest note in the singer's register, top note in the song, and we ride that right across the end of the bridge into the chorus. But that's really determined for us by Number one, the mood of the record, what we're talking about, yeah, what the singer's saying in the chorus. Yeah. And number two, the chord progression at the end of the bridge. If it's climbing, if it's building, mm -hmm. then we'll soar out. If it's something that's a little bit different, like if we've gone to a different key or, and we need to really settle before we reintroduce that last chorus, then we'll do the breakdown. But it, it's just a feel thing, really. Mm -hmm. It's not really strategic. I apologize for not knowing the answer to this. I should. Um, your bridges are, 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 are actually a secondary hook. And I started thinking, well, I, I remember a song where where you you did you did verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus bridge hook hook mm -hmm. but you actually made the bridge um, a second a secondary hook right. even though it stayed in, it was initially introduced in the spot where the bridge mm -hmm. traditionally is it, it became a second hook an auxiliary hook and it became the stronger hook. As the song, what was, right. you, was, was that was you, right? Yeah, we've done that a few times, and I don't know where that comes from, but a lot of times we'll be riding on the bridge when we're writing it, and when we're programming, it feels so good, or like we got to go back to it, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, mm -hmm. and yeah. it just works and it fits. A couple other times, again, you've noticed some amazing things, but a couple other times we've taken just the vocals off of a bridge, and then somewhere in the fade, we'll reintroduce them over the chorus music, which mm. is a little weird and sometimes That's it doesn't work. That's probably what I was thinking about. Yeah, we do that yeah, quite, a, I, quite a few times. Do you I let like instinct it? sort of guide you in the totally. writing process? And, totally. Yeah, because I find that the, we've had a lot of guests in that particular seat, and instinct, and it's a lot of the top guys, and, and instinct and sort of character of things serves equally as a guide to all the technical stuff, all the, what the capabilities. Totally. If, you, if you let the instinct get away, you don't have lost the same it. thing. Yeah. Precisely. Everything for us is what it feels like. That's exactly. why I say when we're doing a bridge and it feels so good, it's, it's not a formula. You don't say, well, we got to go back to the bridge, but you're having so much fun when you're playing, you're programming, and you're like, and let's go back to that. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Yeah. You know? And so yeah. that's how. And it translates. Yeah, and the, the technology oh, for yeah. us, and I know we speak a lot about this on your show and I've seen it, but the technology for us is secondary. We use that to get out what we hear in our heads. Precisely. And as a producer, and I think probably somewhat as an engineer and mixer, you're doing the same thing. You hear something in your head, it feels how you want it to feel. The trick is to try and get that translator from somewhere in your brain out to the end of your fingers, out the mixing board, yep. or the keyboard, or the synthesizer, or the computer, and come out the speakers. Yep. So we really don't pay a lot of attention to technology, even though I'm a bit of a tech nerd. I use it just to totally get out my ideas. It's like driving a straight shift. I mean, you love the car, you love your Ferrari, but you, you get from point A to B and you don't remember shifting gears right. uh, because it's so much fun. And if it's a, a good car. Uh, yeah. If it's a crappy car, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not fun to drive. A, you get from A to B, but you remember all those painful shifts. That's why yeah. I think the technology is important and you got to have the right stuff, pick the right mm -hmm. stuff, know what things do so that you can mm -hmm. have that seamless transi transition from the head mm -hmm. all the way out the fingers to the speakers. Uh, it's funny you said that I, I recently gave a commencement speech and I was trying to think about what to do, and it, I came with something called the short path, meaning that these guys now, if they just get from here to here, that that distance was all they needed to master to do something great, mm -hmm. which was different than when we all came up. Right. And that path is so critical, so what you do mm -hmm. here, you utilize to get out there, and some right. amazing things can, can it's happen crazy. to you. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, I agree with you. If, uh, if you're thinking about the technical part, then you're missing the point. Mm -hmm. It has to be almost a reaction. Like, I, like my assistants I always tell them, if somebody if somebody says, "Can you turn that vocal up a little bit?" You should just do it, and they should never say, oh, "Can you do it a little more?" Or that's too much, a little less. It, it you, your your body just reacts like a straight shift, and 
and on, on your level it's even more so because you, the minute you stop to think about the technology you're, you're done for the day right well that's what I, I tell a lot of young producers like they ask me like how I do this how I do that one of the most important things for young guys coming up and it's probably true in, in your case as well for your guys like you have to know your gear and you have to know the technology to the point where you're not thinking about oh what plugin should I use or what sense should I use like if I want to add something to one of my tracks I've spent enough time inside my gear to know exactly exactly what I have to go to to be able to get what I need and that's what you're talking about you know the path mm -hmm. like if you have to break down and stop and say okay well let me try this to get what I want or let me try this to get what I want it really inhibits I think Absolutely. the process of what you're trying to create you like got to know it like shooting a free throw and having to think about the mechanics yeah you can't think it's about it's the gonna mechanics. throw you off every time yep, yep. you got to know you, uh, it. you've always since I've known you, you've always been one of those cats that will stop and mentor someone and help somebody man you know, congratulations for that. It. Yeah, I, I would have loved to have seen more of that when I was coming up. You know, somebody to kind yeah. of break things it, down. It was a different me. world when we were coming up. It was a jealousy factor. I mean, I know engineers that wouldn't label their gear or, yeah. or wouldn't even label a console or would not even allow you to get in front of the credenza to see what they were doing. <laughs> Remember those days? And you know who I'm talking about, too. I, I know exactly. A couple people. <laughs> and uh, I mean, gosh, that's, that's so not what we're selling. We're just selling four minutes of escape from the real world it has nothing right. to do with gear but you know I might, might want to give a little shout out to some guys formerly in, in your camp and still in your camp Eric Dawkins one of my favorites and, yep. and of course Tank I love Tank and, yep. great guys and, very uh, talented both of them I knew him as little Steve but we'll just call him he's Steve Russell still little Steve he's still little Steve and Troop was one of my all-time favorite groups Chucky Booker and those were the days I great mean, music yeah well the good thing is I still see all those guys we write together a lot oh, send, send, send my love I will for sure so in the creative process Harvey there's a huge huge gap between getting a great idea and having a finished record like what I notice with most people as they are, are getting into your profession the idea part is pretty good right. executing the idea fairly good they just can't finish anything What's the impediment between that getting to that last step that, 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 that separates you from everybody else that's out there? I mean, there's a lot of talented people out there that can't get anything on the radio because they just can't get... Why is that last step so hard? Well, there's a couple things in my opinion. I don't have the exact answer, but I think some of it's repetition. It's kind of like as you referred to shooting free throws. A lot of guys can kind of play and dribble and throw the ball around, but to get great at something, you have to practice it. You have to really go through it. So you have to spend a lot of time with your tracks, a lot of time listening to other music. When I worked with Rodney, he's a, an amazing finisher of records. He knows how to take a tiniest little piece of an idea and turn it into a hit record. Even if it wasn't a hit when it started, he's probably gonna end up turning it into a hit. So spending time around him, I saw that and I realized that it takes a lot of work. You have to be diligent. You have to go back. You have to revise. You have to revisit. And it's not just as simple as, oh, this is a cool beat. Listen to what I'm playing. Boom, record. That's not how it goes. That's what everybody else is doing. And what I'm trying to teach the young guys that are around me is like, that's how you start and that's how you come with the hotness. That's how you come with what's great, what's kind of cool. But then the next step is cultivate it work it listen to other records study study old music study contemporary music listen to the radio is this going to work is what is what are the sounds and you and i spoke about that what are the vocals sound like what are the backgrounds doing in today's radio yep. what you know is the bass more important than the kick is the kick more those are things that it's a cerebral way of making music which sometimes isn't the funnest way to do it it's nice just to have the idea and throw it out there but for me i've found success at really trying to study and be smart and approach music like this is a great idea what do I have to do to get it to the next step so I think that's one explanation for I think why I do what I do the other is really knowing as I said your gear and knowing how to get the idea from early stages to sounding like a great first you know high rate quality record and, and both of them tie into <clears throat> excuse me um, we reference Mal Malcolm Gladwell pretty regularly around here the particularly outliers which the notion is is that 10,000 hours changes people who people just think were blessed with talent mm -hmm. and actually makes them experts in what they're doing. That's essentially what you're talking about. Yep. You have to put in the time, know what you're doing, get comfortable, have it in your DNA, then the ideas have a path to go to to become what you right. need to do. But if you're not doing the work, you're shortchanging yourself. Yeah. And it's an old school lesson that we just have to keep repeating because 
technology, you know, folks today with technology think that it's automatic, and they, yeah. they're actually just turning out crap a lot of well, times. Well, it's the advent of, like you said, technology, but also like American Idol and things like that. It's a great show, but it's made people think that this is an overnight thing. You know, you, I write songs, I put them on my computer, I got GarageBand, I should be on the radio, and it's out. not how it works, yeah. mm -hmm. not how it works. Sometimes I feel too like, um, instead of mastering the technology and having it work for me, I'm, I feel like I'm just in a constant battle with the technology. It seems like I, it seems like one of these days I'd get comfortable enough to where I'd feel like, man, I got this thing whipped, now I can do it. It's like every day I fight the technology and on good days I win, on bad days I don't. Yeah. How, um, like, if I had to describe you and the underdogs, I would say a lot of producers, 99% of them are like Target. You go in and you buy a suit off the shelf, and but you guys are more like that high quality tailor. Mm -hmm. you, you come in, you take the measurements, and you craft a song just for that artist. Mm -hmm. Is that is that part of what what allows your creativity to flourish, or is that something you, you just enjoy doing better that way, or how does that play We've into always, what you do? Yeah, we just always work that way, and for us, you say uh, Target versus a tailor, we've always said you know, fast food versus a, a fine restaurant, mm -hmm. and we've talked about that in mm -hmm. our studio all the time. Mm -hmm. A lot of people it are just doing drive-through, you know, it's like, okay, quick burger, burger, fries, exactly. fries, fries. Mm -hmm. So for us, we like to work with the artists. We like to listen to what they've done, and again, it kind of goes back to my nerd approach to making music like mm -hmm. you got to study you got to know what the artists done what it, where have they been and so it, for that reason we don't just sit around usually making generic songs that we then pitch to artists usually it's like okay Harvey you're gonna do a record with Beyonce or you're gonna do a record with Chris Brown or whoever it is so we'll take that time take that week we know we book them in have them in the room we vibe with them we listen to you know the radio we pull songs off the internet to just listen to and then we start creating. Mm -hmm. So it's special, specific for them, specific for what's going on in their life, specific for where they're trying to go musically, style-wise, and where they've already been. We don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. We want to set them up for something new. So that's, I think, maybe some of what you're hearing. Most of our songs are really created and they're mm -hmm. catered. They just for fit the artists so seamlessly. That's do you get a chance to step outside of sort of your musical box into other interest levels in terms of what you like or is it mostly urban pop stuff? Oh no, you? I'm way out of my bubble. Yeah, yeah. I never listen to urban pop. Me, no, in the same day. way. And I listen to it when I get to the studio right. because I, I'm smart about it. I know what's going on and, and we have to make records to beat these other ten records. Right. I'm very competitive so I do study it but I'm listening to jazz, I listen to classical, mm -hmm. I listen to country western talk music. Radio. I listen to a ton of talk radio. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I listen to now is this, you know, the kind of the up tempo, the dubstep stuff sure. and a lot of Absolutely. overseas stuff, Swedish House Mafia, Skrillex, that sort of thing. Yep. I mean, just the production. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if you like it, but the engineering yeah, uh, and the mixing. Man. I was I was insane. turning people on to um uh, to that stuff six or seven years ago. The sounds that they're uh, using? When I was first telling people about Beatport, they were like, what? Beat what? Yeah. Skrillex got five nominations, I, I think, did. this time. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Best New Artist, which is really cool. Yeah, really rare. Um, can, 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 I think production can be learned, although the ones that have a gift for it, obviously, do better. But can songwriting be learned? I mean, I've always yes. wanted to be a songwriter, and I just suck so badly. No, Give me can, some hope. It can be learned. There's a formula to writing songs, in my opinion. This is, again, just the way I do it. Um, you can't learn how to decide what to talk about, or you can't learn how to string the lines together, lyrically speaking, but you can learn kind of the basics of it. And that's when I work with young songwriters. They come around me, and, and they start at a certain place. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but when they have spent time with me, they've learned, like, OK, this is what it takes to, to write a good song. I can't promise anyone hits, because that's, you know, yeah, like you said, that's a gift. But done. as far as writing a song, there is a way that you mm -hmm. can approach it. And it goes back to, again, studying. Mm -hmm. Like, listen to the songs that came before. I listened to, like you said, Quincy records, mm -hmm. Michael Jackson. Uh, and then after that, it was Babyface and mm -hmm. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and Teddy Riley. Study those songs. Look at what they did. And even when I was coming up as a songwriter, I would recreate their music. Mm -hmm. I sat on my computer and I'd learn how to play all their chords. Mm -hmm. I'd learn how, where they went on their bridges. I'd try and find their bass sounds. Uh, that's kind of leaking into production a little bit. But mm -hmm. as far as writing songs, study and learn. And hence, having that broad sort of array of listening 
taste because you're going to learn technique from country songs. Everywhere. Yeah. You learn from everything you listen to. You Big know? time. I mean, it's just fascinating. I, you know, we had sort of, you know, when you come from Canada, you go to Kentucky and you come to L.A., you listen to a lot of stuff along the way. Yeah. And there's something informative about it all. Mm -hmm. And the more you... The more you inculcate, the more it comes out in ways that, that are informative. So it's ammunition that you can Absolutely. draw from. Absolutely. And you're not always going to make, you're probably not going to make a country record or a hard rock record. But if you have all those influences, then you can interject them into your pop songs, your mm -hmm. R&B songs. That's going to be what kind of gives you that cool little slant or Absolutely. twist. Anything new. I preach that. Absolutely. Better to sound new than sound good. Um, Very true. <laughs> uh, if this if, if if this is inappropriate, just let Herb know and he'll bitch slap me, but <laughs> how do you write a song with how do you write a song like No Air with eight thousand writers on that song? I mean, is there anybody in LA that didn't get a writer's credit on that song? Like more succinctly, um, how do you manage like getting all those varied influences into a song that works so cohesively like that? Well, I think that's, some people just wrote a D or an and or a but. Right? No, there's no really ands and those. We call those and and the writers. We have a, you know, some of those around the studio, and you got to send them well, out. Well, there's like what seven or eight. Like James Fauntleroy is one of my great favorite writer. guys. Great, I great love writer. I love James. In fact, I James think is going to be on the show. As a producer now, not maybe years past, but now as a producer, one of your jobs is to manage the writing process. And at least that's one of the the jobs that I assume. But those are some serious egos you got to manage. No, nah, but song. it's. It is, but if that's part of the job. As a producer, you have to cast it. It's almost like doing a film. You're like, okay, what's the track? Who's the best top line guy for that? Who's got the best melody? And Absolutely. in the camp setting that we work in, there's a ton of great people around. There's a lot of great energy. And as a producer, or one of the producers, it's my job to try and pair the people up. And in that instance, as in many instances, we have a lot of guys that we love to write with. Some of, guys, some of the guys bring energy, just a good vibe, good feel. Some of the guys bring great melodies. Mm -hmm. Some people, one guy will have the crazy concept. One guy will you know, have a bridge idea. And a lot of times we'll leave but a bridge you, open for you, a writer. You're, you're, you're totally capable of sitting down and writing that song 100% by yourself. No, that's that's I, I not true. You, I think you can. I, I would, I would, I'd you, like to be able to say what, I could. But what makes you... I don't think any of the eight writers on that credit could have written that song by themselves. Really? No way. That's what makes that song What's special. the lesson there? I mean, that, that just, I can't imagine doing a mix with eight people. No, it's hard enough with just me and the producer. Well, I couldn't imagine producing with eight people, but writing, for some reason, the collaborative energy Give me an example of, like, like what, what did James bring to the party? If, 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 if you yeah, can say, if you can't no, say, I, I, I don't want to. No, um, James brought a ton to the party. James brought melody. Mm -hmm. uh, James brought lyrics. When James goes in the booth, he starts saying things. Mm -hmm. Unlike a lot of writers, even myself, I'll go in the booth and mumble and hum. But James, when he goes in the booth, the words are coming out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a little weird. And then Steve, Steve, <laughs> Steve brought something. Steve, Steve just tightened that up a little bit. Steve brings lyric as well. After James had some melody ideas, I had a couple melody ideas. Steve had some melody ideas. Specifically, Steve kind of came up with the B-section melody. And so oh. once we get all our melodies strung together, then we'll mm -hmm. sit together and we'll say, man, you said something about this and No Air is kind of cool. Why don't we talk about this? And let's tie No Air into meaning this. And you know, that's one thing as a songwriter that we preach in our building is like the title of the song, all the lyrics need to lead up to the title of the mm -hmm. song. If you listen to mo a lot of songs, they're, they're random thoughts and they're disconnected. Yeah. So for us, a lot of times we'll start with that concept. No mm -hmm. Air was started by saying, no air and and how are we going to explain that? What does that mean? What a great concept! Mm -hmm. So that's you know, that's I mean, the we've answer. We've all right been here. in that position, but nobody's quite described it like that. How's your arm? You ready to throw some throw some pitches? You, 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 you did quite. He's not familiar with batter's box. You got to be careful where. How's your arm? Harvey, Harvey's fast on his feet. Batter's box. Like, uh, he's an athlete. I was in the final four. You didn't worry about him. <laughs> Final four. God, that's incredible. Throw some pitches. Let's have Harvey okay. knock them out. And Vintage King. I love that little tube in their logo. I don't know why I'm distracted. The shiny objects just distract me, as you know. Okay, Harvey. Yep. Um, give, give me your go-to piece of gear creatively in terms of instruments. Okay. Bass. Trilo bass, of course. Trilogy or ESX24, a sample bass that we've created. Very important for our records. Wow. Bass is a key, key part of our, our yeah, production. Definitely. Uh, piano. ESX24, a sample again that we've created. It's like based off of Steinway Grand. 
Wow. Uh, synth strings. Uh, Omnisphere. There's a pet patch in Omnisphere that we use for synth strings every time. Wow. I don't know what it's called, so otherwise I would tell you. Um, do you have a patch you like for acoustic guitar? No. Just use the real I don't one. like acoustic <laughs> guitar patches. I mean, you know, for the trendy acoustic guitar sound, there's a couple in, uh, again, ESX, but I love acoustic guitar on records, the real deal. And yeah. We have a great guy, yeah. Andrew, in our studio who kills the acoustic guitar. The, uh, those kind of those kind of uh, Euro dance buzzy synth sounds. Oh, goodness, you're really testing my gear knowledge. Um, skip that one, I'll come back okay. to it. I'll think about it. What about Massive, the uh, plugin you ever use? I use Massive, yeah. Um, Vanguard I use a ton, now that it's coming to me. Vanguard, I use uh, Albino a lot, uh, and I use uh, Omnisphere, it has a lot of cool things in that. I as thought well. I heard Massive on your stuff. Yeah. Um, regular pads. Uh, probably again Omnisphere. I okay. use that a lot. And uh, Rhodes? Rhodes, there's some dorky little thing that comes with stock and logic that I use. And I, don't, I think it's something 88 that I use. And we've tweaked it and added five or ten plugins to are, it. Are, are, you, are you writing in logic? Yep. And then you, you, at what point do you transfer it to Pro Tools? Never. Oh, okay. Just if, if you send it to a mixer that likes Pro Tools, you just. Well, that's the thing. And we didn't really talk about that. But I mix everything from Logic from the time I start programming. And, I'm, okay. I, and I've done that for 10 years. Mm. And that's a lot of times what's preventing me from going to outside mixers. Not to mess up batter's box, we can go into that later. Mm. No, that's a good point. No, no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm simultaneously angry and curious. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's your, uh, I mean, I wonder why, I wondered why, you know, you gotta wonder sometimes, just, you know. Uh, as a manager, I haven't made the call. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just teased him. Um, What's your favorite, uh, just you got an idea and you want to get it in some form to remember what's your favorite keyboard for that? Yamaha yeah, Grand Piano every time. I sit there with my little dictaphone, I have the one with the cassette still on it, mm -hmm. and I sit on the piano and play it and put it on that. Wow. I'm listening. <laughs> what, was that? what was that about? Oh, yeah, that's, pretty cool. that's old school. I know, yeah, it's horrible. That's, that's, cool. it. that's bad, but that's, that's what I still do. Uh, speaking of old school, what's your favorite old school analog synth? Mini Moog. Easy. Uh, I still it, have the, one. The SE one or the original? No, the original that you can't save patches on. You got to twist the knobs and make grease pencil markings on where you liked it. Yeah. Those. And even then, it doesn't work. No, it never comes back. Uh, um, and then, what's your favorite synth for under a thousand dollars? That's tough because I don't really know what the stuff the synths cost. But like most of the plugins are the things that I'm using, and so I don't think I don't think any of those are a thousand dollars. So you mentioned several. Uh, Omnisphere has a ton of great sounds. Uh, ESX is the internal sampler in the Logic, and I use probably 60% of my sounds come out of that. I've just built up a library of samples and sounds that plug right into that, so I would say between those two things. Drew? Yes, sir. Hit me with a couple. Okay, cool. Uh, from Angelo J. Rossi, what's it like growing up with parents who are so talented and famous? Is there a lot of pressure to excel, or is it a creative incubator environment, or both? Well, my parents were both musicians, and I mean, I don't know if they were both famous, I think they said famous, but they were both musicians. My dad was super successful at They both instrument. went to Berkeley too. Um, both went to New England Conservatory of Music. My dad went to Berkeley and then transferred to New England. My mom went to New England. But oh, wow. anyways, in that environment, it was really cool because I had musicians in the house that I could play music for and I could sit at the piano and they would show me things. And so I didn't really feel the pressure. The only pressure I felt was trying to play drums. And I knew I wasn't going to be good at drums like my dad was. So. And that wasn't even pressure. I was young, and I was like, man. But you also had basketball, awesome. so at some point, basketball was greater pressure than music was. Basketball it? was always the pressure. Music yeah. was my outlet. It was my relaxation Same time. Here. So, good uh, question. Good yeah, question, uh, uh, Angelo. Another one from IMS Seven Thirty One. Uh, how about all the hats uh, Harvey Mason wears? Music, movies, label owner. Uh, gun to your head. If you had to choose one, which would that be? Music producer. I love making records. I love being in the studio. I love having my hands on the keyboard. And I also surprisingly love interacting with artists, even though they're crazy most of the time. I have a good time. Mm. They're cool with us. They're, they're, not, they're not like the little. No, people. they're not. They're not, you know, crazy, but they're, you know, there's a lot of personalities. When people see in the public, fun. we tend to not get that when they come. They tend to no. come with no makeup, sweats, and a good attitude. 
Well, maybe for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, from Two Radic. Uh, can you save a poor song with great arrangement and production? Oh, great question. I say yes. Most people would say no. I, but I'm, maybe I'm optimistic. But I, I think agree, you I agree can, with you. I know you can you dress can. it up. It may, may not be a classic copyright that lasts 20 or 30 years, but I think you can make it cool enough to be on the radio and have people like it. Gene Simmons once said, uh, you can't polish a turd, but you can always spray paint it gold. And I think he also said, and you can roll it in glitter. <laughs> Drew, Drew, come with another question to, to clean up what Dave just did. Okay. Uh, blame, blame Raddick. That wasn't my fault. <laughs> From Leo Saramago. Oh, uh, Leo. Leo's our boy. Yeah. Do you base your songwriting on a message beforehand, or do you let the music inspiration lead? Both. A lot of times I'll have a concept or one of the 12 guys that's writing will have a concept. <laughs> other times an idea of music will come to me or Damon or one of the other guys and I'll be like, man, I love that track. We got to write that for such and such. And then when we book a, se a session with such and such, we'll refer to that track that we loved. We'll pull it up and then again, we'll do what I talked about. We'll figure out what they want to say and where they're at in their life. So we go either way as far as where we start the creative process. The um the, 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 the last question is, you survived the nutty factory. Are, are you still standing? Are you still good? Oh, I'm good. Oh, come on, that's not nutty. Good. I love it. Good, it, good. It, love it. It looks better when you see it back on, on TV or on, <laughs> on the computer. It looks a lot better. That's great. I wish I had the show when I was coming up. Me too. I would love to hear Me the too. insight behind what makes people tick. And we, we, we get that a lot. It could have saved us an easy five or couple ten couple years. couple years, yeah, yeah. Definitely. But you know what? In, in some some ways, I wish there was enough mentors to go around so that everybody could have had the mentoring that we had. Like you had Rodney, you mm -hmm. had uh, uh, a lot of people. Your dad, you know. And I, I had. I, I'm here here because of the kindness of a, a lot of people. That um, I don't know how you encourage uh, uh, people that want to do this for a living. I don't know how you encourage them to uh, to be able to find those people. You just have to. They kind of find you though, don't they? A little bit, and you have to reach out. I mean, you have to be hungry and aggressive, and you can't be talented and just sit around and wait for something to come. You have to be aggressive. Yeah, phone doesn't ring. When I tried to, her, her managed me at a point where I was thinking about being a producer, and I wouldn't play my material for anybody, which was a bit of That's an tough. impediment. That's, That's a little tough. <laughs> so I, just, I just didn't have the, I just didn't have the, I don't know. Uh, mixing, <laughs> I, I can compete with anybody, but. Emotionally, hmm. I'd love to come back and get more into you know some of the technical stuff and like I talked about the the process of how we make our records and I know it's your show, Dave, and you're one of the best mixers on the planet. But the reason I don't go outside and do mixes is because I am doing it. And we talked a little bit about it. Yeah. From the first time I push the piano, it has a plug-in on it. The kick mm -hmm. drum has something that I love, and we do that process. And you asked, do I ever dump the Pro Tools? I don't. I leave it in Logic. Vocals are in Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. I run them simultaneously, and, and I'm always tweaking, and I'm always mixing mm -hmm. the whole time. So I'd love to come back and talk more about that. Oh, man, anytime. Right. anytime. Thank anytime. you guys for having oh, me. Pleasure. Yeah. Love you, the show. You, you're, you're on our all-gray show. Oh. <laughs> This is our That's first right. all great show. I sprinkled so, in a little color for you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Drew, uh, you know, Drew, uh, Drew. I'm the exception to every rule. That's all right, but you usually are. <laughs> uh, once again, folks, before Dave wraps up, remember our good old 1073, December 15th. There you see it up on the screen, and you see how to enter right underneath it. Um, I hope you guys learned a lot. You learned from one of the best. We will have him back. There's some other things for us to talk about. And Dave, why don't you... Uh, Wrap it up. Yeah, guys. Uh, man, I can't express to you how much was, uh, how, how many good ideas I got listening to Harvey. But one of the main things he said that kind of just struck a chord with me was he said he just really loves making records. Uh, I think at the end of the day, that's what drives us all. We just love being part of the record making process. No one person can, can be a part of the entire process, but as much of that process as you can master and control yourself, it just it's just so much fun and. If you don't have that, you might want to question trying to do this for a career because uh, uh, we use records metaphorically and, 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 and there's just something about the whole process that's just as much fun as the end result. And um, go back and check that ITL out. There's a lot of applications that that'll do for you too. And, um, and I hope you're enjoying your holidays and we'll holidays <laughs> and uh, we'll see you again next week.